Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name's Naga Manchetti. It's my absolute delight to welcome you all to the award ceremony for the 2017 Bruntwood Prize for Playwriting. Now, in January of this year, the Royal Exchange Theatre and Manchester property company Bruntwood launched the 2017 Bruntwood Prize for Playwriting and we opened to submissions. By the end of by the deadline of the 5th of June 2017, we had received 1,898 scripts from all corners of the British Isles and Ireland. And so over the last six months, we've seen a dedicated collection of more than 100 readers, including previous winners, directors, critics, designers, actors and agents, taking each script through a rigorous process to create a shortlist of just 10 remarkable and ambitious new plays. So the award ceremony today is a chance to introduce you to the 10 plays which have made that shortlist and you're going to see an extract from each and we'll hear about the playwrights aspirations for their plays. And the award ceremony is also being streamed, live streamed today through the Write Play, Write a Play website. So for anyone who's online, just come on, hello, welcome, welcome and enjoy joining us. The judging panel for the prize was this year chaired by Kirsty Lang. 2015 award ceremony host who we were delighted to welcome back and she'll be announcing the first prize winner of £16,000 later today. All winning plays will go on to be developed by the Royal Exchange with a view to production. So first I'm going to introduce Sarah Frankham, Artistic Director of the Royal Exchange Theatre, for a brief welcome. delighted to welcome you all this afternoon to the Royal Exchange and to the announcement of the winners of the 2017 Bruntwood Prize for Playwriting. You know, this is such an incredibly exciting day for us here because we're celebrating the breadth of talent that has emerged from the prize and also the far-reaching legacy of its work. The gesture of completing a play and sending it out to the prize to be read and carefully considered, I think, is a really brave act. And I think it's really important to recognise the achievement of nearly 2,000 people who submitted to the prize this year. 62% of those were entering the prize for the first time. And 34% of our entrants had never written a play before. So that means that this year over 650 people had written their first play. And since 2005, over 3,300 first plays have been written for the Bromwood Prize. And that makes me really excited for the future it would show that playwriting is alive and well in the UK. Each of those scripts was taken through a rigorous process of being read, re-read, discussed and read again by a group of highly experienced and respected readers who included previous winners, award-winning directors, international playwrights, dramaturgs, critics, designers, actors. Over 100 people contributed to this process and I'd like to thank them for the dedicated time and attention they gave to each script. The Bromwood Prize is about more than the work you see on our stages and the winning plays. Each of the 100 plays on the long list will receive detailed feedback and many of those are offered further support by theatres and companies local to them. Many of the directors who read for the prize also go on to have a relationship with the scripts they have read and it's wonderful when those plays come to life in spaces around the UK. We've continued to live stream workshops to open up the process of playwriting and we're excited to partner with Playwriting Australia, the University of Delhi and the Public Theatre in New York to offer our online community support from leading international playwrights and theatre makers. At its heart, the Bruntwood Prize for Playwriting encapsulates collaboration and partnership. From really small beginnings, it's now the biggest award committed to new plays in the country. And at the root of this success has been an intimate relationship with Bromwood as a partner and a shared desire to discover new talent and support playwrights at the heart of, pit, at the heart of pit theatre making. And I'm delighted that our relationship with Bromwood and Michael Oglesby continues to grow and flourish. And thank you, Mike. Um, it's always a lovely, brilliant day to bring everything together and it's just brilliant to have you here with us. The Bromwood Prize for Playwriting also celebrates a range of partnerships across the industry. I'd like to thank Nick Hearn Books, one of our original partners, 
who share one of the key aims to open up playwriting to as many people as possible and enable the winning plays to have a far wider reach beyond the production. Their partnership and support for this prize is invaluable. We're delighted to be working with the Royal Court Theatre to co-produce the overall winner and Manhattan Theatre Club to develop one of the judges' awards. The Kenyan Institute in Ohio and Banff in Canada and National Theatre New Works continue to offer invaluable support for the playwrights beyond their winning script. I'd like to say a really big thank you to our judges this year. Phil Porter, Lucy Prabble, Lindsay Turner, Matthew Zia, Alfred Enoch and Russell T Davis for their passion and insight, time and commitment. And I'm absolutely delighted that Kirsty Lang, having hosted this award ceremony in 2015, has returned to chair the panel of judges. These plays have taken us out of our immediate experience, illuminating the truth of our existence in a fresh way. Plays that have explored the limitless possibilities of an audience's imagination and the bold gesture of live performance. These plays feel they are questioning the world we are living in now with an urgency and immediacy that demands to be experienced in a live space and opens up the definition of what a play is and can be. Theatre is a contemporary art form which questions the world around us, feels more vital now than ever before. And as we are introduced to this new set of plays that encapsulate the ambition of theatre and this competition, I would like to congratulate all these shortlisted playwrights on their achievement. Now let's find out about them. Thank you. Sarah, thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to welcome Michael Oglesby, Chairman of Brontwood and member of the judging panel, who'd like to say a few words. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, may I add my very warm welcome to that of Sarah to you all here today. Um, this really is one of the most exciting days of my, my year. It, it really is very special. In fact, it's not just today that it's exciting, it's the whole process. Um, from the minute that we have our very first meeting when we sit down and say the next competition, um, is, is, is a wonderful experience. Uh, it's, yes, it's full of excitement, but it's also full of apprehension. You know, there's great uncertainty, which is, of course, what really adds to the arts, makes the arts really special. The fact that you don't know, the fact that you really have no idea. So when you put out that first call for plays, you know, you really do wonder. You know, you really don't know. Are those playwrights in their garrets? Are those people that have never written a play before? Are those people that have tried and tried and not so? Are they going to have another go? Are we? No, what's going to happen? And I was clearly <laughs> delighted to find that, uh, you know, when the, day, when the day came, you know, there we were, over nearly 1,900 plays, once more. All those people wanting to have a go. I had an interesting experience on, on Friday night. I was at a dinner and I was on a panel and we were talking and there were questions afterwards and somebody stood up at the back of, back of the room and he said, do you know, I've entered every Bruntwood Prize since the day it started. Mike, how do you win a Bruntwood Prize? And all I could say is, try again. <laughs> I think that's, it. that's perfect, perfect, perfectly true. So, you know, we get the plays, which is fine. N numbers are fine, but really numbers aren't what it's all about, are they? It's the quality. Is the quality there? And again, we just don't know. Well, I'm delighted to tell you that the quality this year is even better. The quality is just amazing. It, it really is. Um, it took the judging panel six and a half hours to, ju to, go, to judge ten plays. Now, six and a half hours in one room is, is a lot of time, and it ebbed backwards and forwards, and it wasn't until the last quarter of an hour when things seemed to be coming together just. So, but that, that just shows the, 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 the quality of what we have, and, and, and that's, that's really great. 
But again, reading the plays is fine. It's what they're going to look like on that stage that really is, 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 is what it's all about. That really is the, 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 the magic. And having seen three of the last time's four winners so far, I have to say that they were absolutely superb. They really were great plays. In fact, I would say three of the best plays that I've seen for a long time. And that really is very satisfying. It really um, is very stimulating. I mean, we, I, all of the plays, Jean and I came out of saying, gosh, that made me think. You know, we really, you're really buzzing. Uh, after coming out of them. And that's, that, to me, is the measure of a really good play. If you come out really stimulated, really buzzing, that's what, that's what really makes a great play. And, you know, in these times when uh, the world is moving so quickly, changing all the time, unless you're really moving with it, um, and, you know, your communities aren't working together and changing, your cities aren't working and, and doing things, you aren't thinking about the future, you aren't, aren't being creative. If society isn't being creative, then it doesn't get anywhere. And that's the great thing about the theatre, arts generally, but the theatre particularly. It really does stimulate, it really does get people thinking and, and questioning themselves, questioning their values, questioning where they go forward. And the, and the theatre has, has an important role to play. I'm particularly proud to be, I call myself a Mancunian now, having been here for 40 plus years, to be a Mancunian, to be part of the art scene, to be part of the theatre in Manchester, because I really do think that Manchester has, has an art scene to be proud of. And that has really contributed to the changes that have come about in this city. This, this city has really reinvented itself um, over the last 20 years particularly. It's a very different city. And I like to think that the arts have really played an important role in that, of creating people and, and a climate in the city that really does think and question, um, lives on the edge. And living on the edge is pretty, impo pretty important today. So, I hope you will enjoy the plays that you're about to see, and I hope you will see that they are quite on the edge, quite different, quite challenging, because that's what a Bruntwood play is all about. Thank you. So let's begin. Let's take a look at these shortlisted plays. First up, King Brown, by first-time playwright Laurie Nunn, takes us to 1973 Australia, in the outskirts of Melbourne. My name is Laurie Nunn and my play is called King Brown. My play is set in Australia in 1973. The plot centres around um, the Brown family and we meet them when the patriarch of the family is about to return home after an extended stint in prison. And as the tensions rise and the patriarch returns home, the family is changed forever. I was inspired to write the story because it's really um, based on my mum's childhood growing up in Australia. It's such a sort of potent landscape and it's something that I always come back to over and over again but I'd never really explored it in my writing before. I think once I realised that I wanted to do something that was about a sort of big dysfunctional family, um, there was something I found really exciting about being able to just cram them into a space together and I really liked the sort of intensity of just having them in this house and just seeing what would happen. But I also think it's really important to look into the past to sort of see where, how we got to where we are and I think particularly in the world at the moment in terms of just the sort of rise of misogyny I think it's, a, it's an important thing to look back and really think about how far have we come and look in our own lives and the people around us and our own choices. So, you got a girlfriend yet, mate? Nah, <laughs> too busy sticking those hands on the rocks to have a girlfriend. All the girls around here are ugly moles. What does his mum say about you sticking your hands under rocks? Looking for snake skins. Bringing snakes under the house, more like taking years off my life. Is that true? Well, I, I only catch ones that ain't poisonous. He's gonna get himself killed. Uh, have you caught any today? 
Only one. They're coming to ground because they know the fires are coming. Couldn't you get yourself another hobby, mate? Something a bit less fucking stupid. <laughs> I like watching them. The way they move. It's like they're floating on air or something. I can't figure it out. It's like magic. Come here. Sit down. I'm going to tell you a story that will make every hair on your ball sack stand on end. It was the middle of summer. Your uncle and Mark and me were coming home from school, down by the tracks. Mark saw her first. All the colour drained out of his face. That's how I knew she was a big one. Stretched out across the path, baking in the sun, the biggest tiger snake I have ever seen. I'm saying like from here to about here. And I do not exaggerate. And she must have been pregnant because she was nice and fat and real aggressive. <laughs> So Mark and me stand there for ages trying to figure out what to do. We have two choices. We either go back the way we came, or we risk it, and then we try and jump right on over and pray she doesn't wake up. Grub won't be too long now. Shh, Dad's telling a story. Oh yeah? What's the story? I was talking about that time when we uh, came across that great big snake on the way home from school, remember? I don't know, we've seen so many snakes. Oh, you don't forget this one. It was like from uh, here to about here. You said it was smaller than that before. You exaggerated. It's called artistic license. <laughs> right, anyway, she was a big, mean old bitch. <laughs> Language! So did you jump over it? Mark here wanted to go the long way around. It would have taken us half an hour. And, uh, well, at that time I was getting a bit you know, churdy. So I figure I'm going to try and jump over myself and see if I can get Mark to follow. So, <coughs> Marky, he's frozen to the spot, right? I see the snake and I think, right, I'm going to have to get myself something to defend myself with. <coughs> I'm looking around and there's not even a bloody rock in sight. Now finally I find myself a big old tree branch. So I figure that'll do. And I start creeping towards where that snake is asleep. And I'm getting closer and closer. I'm about two feet away. And she opens her eyes. This slinky bitch is looking right at me. Eyes like two big half moons. So I take a step back. But before I know it, she's up. And with a flick of lightning, her tongue comes out and nearly catches me on the chin. Marky screams, I hit her as hard as I can, right? But she comes back up again, over and over. Finally, I smack her right in the middle of the face and I keep beating until there's nothing but blood and brains. <laughs> I tried to take the head out to show her mother. But my dad caught us and gave us a pound for being so fucking stupid. Cool. It could have killed you, there's nothing cool about it. I know, that's why I told the story in the first place. You don't fuck with these things unless you've got shit for brains. Have you got shit for brains, son? <laughs> In the next play in the shortlist, Idris can't think of why he'd want to stay on Earth, but he can think of many reasons to leave for a future on Mars in This Is Not America by Joshua Val Martin. My name is Joshua Val Martin and I wrote the play This Is Not America. This play is about a young man called Idris who applies, or he wants to go to Mars, and I suppose in the play I was kind of looking at why someone would want to leave the Earth and create this potentially better society on Mars, or why he'd want to stay on Earth with his, with his family, with his sister, with his, with his girlfriend. When I, when I first wrote it at least, it was about why I wanted to leave the earth, why, why you'd actually think things at the moment currently aren't that great, whether personally, politically, professionally, and I actually want to get out of all of it. So maybe it's about two, three years ago, there was a Scandinavian company was offering people the opportunity to go to Mars. And that was it. I thought, oh, that'd be cool. A play about a guy who goes to Mars. Yeah, this was very much more about, like I said, those, those sort of ideologies at the moment, like the re-emergence of, I mean, ideology generally, but ideologies in which, let's say, that's what we want a big shift in the past and go somewhere else. Um, that's something that I'm looking at and questioning, I hope, rather than saying it's right or it's wrong. Were you wanting anything? I got your t 
text is all. Surprise you're not busy. Well, I reckon I thought it'd be polite to pop round, considering. This is it. <laughs> yes, that this is it. You dove sod, I'm your sister, come here. You won't be able to learn guitar in space, you do know that. Uh, they don't have music in space. We'll have recorded music, and the Swiss blog sings, so he says. Oh, lucky, because you're an awful singer. Got a feeling my music won't be to their taste anyway. <laughs> you had the worst taste in music. <laughs> I remember you and your first CD, Walkman. Your eyes lit up <laughs> that you could put your All Saints CD into it and listen to it wherever you went. <laughs> you were so amazed by that Walkman that you took the whole thing apart, piece by piece, until it wasn't a Walkman, but just a table full of plastic and metal bits and pieces. Dad didn't get me another one. You were a cute kid. You do know that. But I'm not changing my mind this evening. I know. Just in case, that's why you're here. This will be the last time I see you, Idris. Probably. As, as soon as I got your text, of course, I wanted to come round and see you. Is that your wife? Yes. In the car? I wanted to talk to you alone, though. Don't suppose there'd be much point in meeting her now. I just thought it would be nice for us to, like, I'm not changing talk, my mind. maybe, about your last day on this earth. You could do anything. How are you going to spend it? Sorry to interrupt, oh. Idris, but you want the bins taken out today. I can never remember when it is. It is Thursday's race. Mr. Brown bins <laughs> today. But Stella's only been here since last week. And the brown bins are the one with the cans. It's the mixed recycling. So the cans. Well, yeah, there are cans, but there's plastic in there too. <laughs> but not the paper. Right. I'll take the brown bin out. Right, great. Thanks, Stella. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you see the <clears throat> saying. I was asking about today. Yeah. How are you going to spend your last day on Earth? Well, it's weird when you say it like that. <laughs> it's like your 13th birthday. You never think, and then it... And then your 14th, 15th, 21st. It's that night out you've been looking forward to. It's the peck on the cheek you'll get when you see that person who keeps you up at night. Be a good question to ask on a day that. What would you do with your last free day on Earth? On a first day, you'd say you spend it with your mum, with your family. It'd be a cute answer because you're both still at that stage where you can be whoever you want. <laughs> now, on a third or fourth day, you'd say something crazy with a K. <laughs> Parachuting or shooting up. You think you know me well, surprise. <laughs> but when you get to that stage when you're happy to be walking by in a canal in silence holding hands, I think I'd say, I'd organise my funeral, I'd write me will, I'd leave me flat in my girlfriend's name, I'd send a text to those that I love to let them know that I'm going. Hey, hey we can hang out today if you'd like. I wanted to ask you something actually. I'm not. Now listen. I am going to Mars. <laughs> I've hardly forgotten. <laughs> but how about a bit of you stays? Hmm? But me and Rasheen, we're trying for a baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a big ass. <laughs> I know. I know this is a bit weird, but. It would mean a lot to us to have a baby. And it would mean a lot to have a little bit of your character still here on Earth. <laughs> Alan McKendrick's O oh, Graveyard You Can't Hold Me Always introduces us to Frog Economics, Library Arson, Partying Professionally and
bartending as nihilism. My name is Alan McKendrick and I wrote the play O Graveyard, You Can Hold Me Always, which is a comedic spectacular concerned with carnage, both literal and metaphorical. I had the great opportunity of developing the piece with some students at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. And there was a phase where I was writing just a series of scenes where the unifying notion was just that every single person who walked on stage during the course of the evening um, would be dressed in some form of uniform or occasional garb. And I remember one day I was really on a roll, but there was a concert I really wanted to see, which was happening at noon as part of the Counterflows Festival. And I thought, all right, I'll just, I'll go down for the noon performance and then I'll go and work. And on the way down there, I uh, saw a person in a chicken suit standing on a totally deserted road holding a sign saying hardwood floors. I had about three minutes from seeing that to going to the venue. And when I got there, there were just under 15 minutes from me getting there and the band going on stage. And I wrote the entirety of the Fur Clown Car Party Drug Express on Two Legs scene in less than 15 minutes there and then from just having seen somebody around the corner. Yeah, it's a, it's a catalyst, ideally, for me, a theatre text. Um, it's something that can still run off in a lot of different directions. Because <laughs> if I can reconvince myself that life is not worth living, that it's not worth living for anyone, then what I did becomes forgivable. It becomes just another big nothing. And humanity at leisure is humanity at its worst. And humanity at leisure at this time of night is humanity really at its worst. And humanity at leisure at this time of night in this establishment is what I really, really need to see right now. I look at these people here in their terrifying, malevolent banality and I, I picture their faces on the bodies of those poor people I set on fire by the motorway. Me? The ice set on fire? <coughs> Picture these faces shrouded in flames and screaming and I, I suddenly feel utterly at peace for a while. Even the children in that crash, the several children in it, would have grown up to this in the end. Better an interrupted journey, better a roadside death, Better to see tongues of flame lick your whole family apart like some lustily fox devoured ice cream. Better a lingering death in a hospital bed with third degree burns over three screaming weeks of inch by inch physical and mental extinction than this as your destination. That's the thing about working the night shift. It provokes thought. <laughs> and uh, who wants that? Well, well, if it isn't the great escape himself. I'd know those sad, smudgy eyes anywhere. <laughs> Lazarus, the panda. Good stuff you pulled back there, in front of the swine. Yeah, I knew what you were doing, but I didn't let on. You're welcome. Mm. Buy a girl a drink. Yeah! Yeah, I knew what you were doing, and I've an idea what you're doing now. Just taking a wild guess. Are you here on purpose? Because being around all these people makes you feel better about those people who died. Because the people here are all pretty conspicuously awful. So maybe the ones you burned alive were too. Yeah. <laughs> I do exactly the same thing. Occupational hazard. Nothing like a crowded bar on a Friday night to make you feel better about your own culpability in the violent death of your fellow man. Or woman. Or library. I'll drink to that. <laughs> Do you want to know something about me, panda eyes? I'll tell you something about me. Partying <laughs> is my profession. The constant criminal activity is just a hobby. Constant criminal activity and playing the drums. But I've got to admit, <laughs> I'm a pretty bad influence on a lot of people. The girls, all guys, I'm not particular, who hang around me, 
They'll take a couple of days off their jobs, then find out they've been fired when they go back to work, and they get all torn up about it. I mean, me, I just say, uh, sorry, friend, but you've got it all wrong. You think you're chocolate, but you're chewing gum. Listen, if you can't handle it, don't hang around me. I don't want to ruin your life just for the sake of a good time. I'm a party professional. I stay in exactly one night of the year, New Year's Eve, because that's when all the fucking amateurs are out. <laughs> Do you want to come back to mine? Yes. It's just that you seem in the frame of mind to experience the human race at its absolute worst. And here I am. <laughs> so I thought it would be generous of me to offer. Maybe some other time then, killer. Maybe some other time. Delving into a world after oil, Daniel Fox Smith's Pump Jack is about aftermaths, pagan gods, and the legacy we choose to leave behind. I'm Daniel Foxsmith and I wrote Pump Jack. Pump Jack is three different generations trying to make their way through three different aftermaths. There's a common theme running through all of them, which is this idea of the black, which is oil, but in a way that we don't see it. It's like a drug. And they all take oil in some way. They all take the black in some way. It's this kind of viscous substance that does different things to different people. And I've been kind of churning this stuff over and there's a lot of stuff about like old gods and our, our kind of folk history in the play. That's a really strong current through it and because I, I feel like we're kind of losing some of that stuff. And I had kind of been looking at climate change like kind of, Naomi Klein describes it really well. She says it's like you look at it with kind of one eye open on it. And she kind of is about encouraging people to kind of get both eyes and kind of lock onto it. And that was the kind of springboard. Those, those kind of became the cornerstones for the play. I really, I, I don't know why, but I really try to make the work uh, speak for now, but also be timeless as much as possible. So it could live in any, live in any age, I think. Um, but yeah, it does, it, this one more so than any of the other stuff I've written feels really like, like it has to be, we have to hear it now. Like we have to hear it now. Grass. No. Green fields. No. Global warming. Extra physical thing. Give up. Garot. No. Get away. No, you're Get not trying. No. Green. You're just saying garot. Glaucoma. I wouldn't be able to see that. I give up. A girl. What? A lovely girl stood right in front of me. Right. Your turn. There's nothing to see. What? What? What about the uh, the letter writing one? Remind me. So we pick someone to write the letter. You. And then we pick a recipient. Me. No. No. It's better. It's not us. <coughs> ah. Why? Because then we'd just be having a conversation. What? God. God. God writes, doesn't she? She wrote the Bible. <laughs> so they say. Okay. God is writing a letter. Who's she writing it to? Man. Man. Or oh. woman. Fine. People. Okay. God is writing a letter to the human race. You saw. To the human race. race. Full stop. <laughs> Hello, you motherfuckers. <laughs> Full stop. Sorry, I haven't been in touch sooner. Things are tricky. And I have lots going on. And my beautiful teeth are agony, full stop. I'm sorry about that. 
the weather not very pleasant at the moment. Sorry, it's shit. But honestly, that's your problem. <laughs> Full stop. I will no longer help you because you treat me and my wife the planet and my teeth with no respect. Full stop. The future is yours now because you, I'm really, really, really pissed off and going on holiday to the Bahamas. <laughs> Full stop. Asta. 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 La. Vista. Taking us to the American Midwest, in Sharon Clark's plow, a lone woman hits the road and starts to walk, while social media fuels both hope and fear. Uh, my name is Sharon Clark, and I wrote the play Plow. Uh, the play deals with uh, a woman who decides to, to undertake a solo trek across the southern states of America, and uh, it concerns the reaction she gets from different parts of society to that trek because she remained silent throughout. And I found a small little snippet about a woman who walked across America. And so I decided to use that as a springboard to start thinking about if social media got involved with that journey and people started to um, expand what she could possibly be doing and um, then suddenly it becomes either very dangerous or very evangelical. And that's what I was really looking at. And especially with America as it is today, is that was really interesting to set that in that context of this time. That image sits next to my desk and I look at her while I was writing the play. So you went and talked to Alan. What else was I supposed to do? It's a story, he agreed. Fuck's sake, B. I got some great images. That's a comfort. Unfortunately, she covers her face when she sees a camera. 
Right, you got it to say something at least? No. Right, react in any way? Uh, no. So nothing? Hey, I got to walk in through downtown. Cars honking at the horns. Christ on a stick. Women begging her to kiss their babies. Some old girl weeping. People trying to touch her. I tell you, made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Can we use it? Ah, uh, depends on the angle. She look crazy? Uh, maybe a little loony too. Not her fault. What else? Uh, there was a couple of hippies straggling behind. What they doing? Following her. Where are they from? No idea. Did you talk to them too? Oh yeah, I tried to. A couple told me to fuck off. Ah, oh, poor baby. It looked to me like every channel had their cameras poking up her ass. Great. Come on, Annie. Let's do this, huh? Well, I've got no choice if Alan says yeah. It's a low shot, by the way. Sometimes she sings. Like out loud, spiritual, opera. It's a fucking good story. It's not a brilliant one, though. I hear foxes sniffing around. Yeah, yeah, well. You know, we'll see. Chris over at New York Times reckons there might be a profile piece in it. And if he thinks that, then... All right, I said all right. We could be the ones to get her name. Fuck's sake, Bean. I said okay, no okay? No one knows where she's come from. She shaved her head. Right? Her head. She shaved all her hair off. On the 40th day. Man, it got so... sticky. So... Muggy, like all the air just got sucked out, struggling to get your breath. Let me tell you, them days is hard. Me, on this road, I prefer the cold. I knows where I am when I can see my own breath. Nobody should be slamming down their feet on tarmac when the mercury hits 30, so I Dipped down off the road and I sat by the stream. Not much of a stream, truth be told. More like the ground was trying to take a piss. I washed my feet, my hands, my chest, my privates. And then I took an old razor and I shaved my head. Just for the cool of it. Just to feel the breeze. <coughs> and then I did me a little shame. Naked as naked could be. I shimmied through that poor excuse on the stream. And then I shimmied right back through it. And oh, it felt so. On my way, Lord. I'm on my way. I have been following her, <coughs> keeping out of sight like when you follow deer. Downwind, you gotta be soundless. I had watched her take off her clothes. I'd seen her bathe in brown water. I saw her wash her face. I saw her touch herself. I saw her shave her head down to stubble. And I saw her wash herself in dirty, dirty water. And then I saw her dance, naked, without shame. When Trick and Nina rent out their spare room, Joni returns to her old home in Tim X Attack's Heartworm. My name's Timothy X Attack, and the title of my play is Heartworm. Well, let's imagine that you and your partner have decided to rent out the spare room. The first person who turns up, she's a young woman called Joni, and she says, this is the house where I used to live. And the rest of the play happens over the course of one night. Um, it doesn't sort of announce itself as a weird play. It looks quite quotidian to begin with. It looks quite day to day. I think its weirdness comes from a kind of sense of, of luminous doubt that runs throughout the entire thing. Just when you think you've got a handle on it, it slightly shifts and turns into something else. 
Heartworm was, was, the, was the title right from the start, but I thought it was something else. I thought it was connected to the idea of the earworm, which is a German word for a tune that won't go away, that you just have in your head. I think, I think Heartworm's a play that's heavily influenced by feelings of grief, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's about grief per se. Um, I, I just wanted to write something that had the quality of a dream, I think. Um, and one of those perturbing dreams where it's so close to real life that you wake up either disappointed or relieved that it wasn't real. everywhere. So, listen, I have 
spent a lot of time on my own recently. Tell me if I've gone too far too suddenly. <laughs> Sentimental. I, I think I need that right now, physically and like emotionally. Knock yourself out. Yeah, yeah, I've done that in there too once. <laughs> <laughs> In Tim Foley's Electric Rosary, when an unusual postulant arrives at St. Grace's Convent, some see her presence as a miracle, but to others, she's the biggest threat to their way of life. My name is Tim Foley and uh, my play is called Electric Rosary. Electric Rosary uh, is a play that's set in the near future and it's about a convent that takes in a robot called Mary. Ultimately, the question is whether Mary the robot is a uh, a good thing or a bad thing, a blessing or a curse. Back in the 1940s, my granddad helped build a monastery up in Scotland, and about 10 years ago, I uh, went there for some time and met his friends, the sort of monks he used to hang out with. Uh, they did not know how to uphold their vows without getting outsiders in, but simply getting outsiders in was breaking their vows, so I thought it was a really interesting dilemma. Fast forward to last year, and I'm spending a lot of time on a farm. Uh, some of them are worried because uh, what we've got, you know, at the moment we've got microchip cows, we've got clever tractors, and they can see what's going to come next, and it is going to be automated production. I wanted to write a very, I mean, a very traditional play with, you know, really human uh, journeys, and yet at the same time there was a robot in it, and there's this huge outside influence of, you know, the, the, the threat of uh, robot kind. Yes, it is a bubble. Um, but I, I think that acts as a kind of, you know, a pressure cooker or a, uh, you know, a, a bubbling pot of tea to look at uh, the bigger things that's happening on the outside. Should I be worried or what? What about Mother Elizabeth? What do other sisters think? I think they're more curious than anything. Can I help you in any way? No, no, I'll manage. Thank you, sister. Second hand? Refurbished. You think they'd send us a new one? Not too dissimilar to our farmers. Well, it looks a lot more advanced. Well, I suspect it's quite basic, really. This is all cosmetic. Look at it. Far too pretty. I was that size once. Very easy to operate. Oh! They sent you paper instructions. I requested a hard copy. I have trouble with screens, but this is none easier. The font, so... I'm happy to help. I'm absolutely fine. I think I've switched her on. I'm just waiting for her to, you know, come alive. It doesn't take long to boot up. Two to four hours is the recommended. Oh, no, it doesn't take that long. Well, that's what it says. I can read that much. What's its name? It's a name. But it's a sign. They it said on. Does it come with a barcode or a label? Mary. Oh, yes? yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're awake. Yes. How long have you... You didn't say anything? Neither did you. Well, I was reading up for, for information to switch you on. Do you require information to switch me on? I don't know. <laughs> Basic. I told you. I'll take it from here. I'll go through some of her simple programming. No, no, thank you, Sister Philippa. Mm. The uh, flowers in the refectory need changing. I'll get Mary to clean those away. Give her a, give her a chore. You know, baptism of fire. Not yet. I'll be going through our simple programming. You can leave us now. And I'll be on hand when you need more help. Thank you, Sister Philippa. <laughs> so, you're awake, yes? I'm awake, yes. Uh, you can remain seated if you... Mm. Maybe I'll sit down too. Look at you. Um, welcome. Now, how do we... Uh, I'm not sure if I trust myself to... Um, I, do you have any questions? Why did you ring the bell? Why did I... Oh, no, I meant the bigger questions, like, where am I? What am I doing here? <laughs> but, well, um, when this room was... 
when we had services here, the bell used to signal when the Holy Spirit was present. Now I just use it to let someone know I want tea. <laughs> you're very... I thought you'd be whizzing and beeping, but you're certainly... Oh, the leaps and bounds we're making a lifetime. I used to have a Tamagotchi. <laughs> that was the height of the technical prowess in my use. Do you know where you are? St. Grace Convent. You have an inbuilt GPS. No. It says on the box, deliver to St. Grace Convent. <laughs> right, yes, sorry. I assumed you'd do it automatically. Oh, I don't know this stuff myself. I'm a, oh, there must be a word for it, like, like a vegan. But for digital things. <laughs> Can you access the internet? Well, that depends on what? On whether you have a computer nearby with internet access? Oh, no, I meant in your head. Oh, no. Oh. So you're just the same as us then? With a few <laughs> exceptions. Well, of course. <laughs> I can't wake up as quickly as you. It took me 3.7 seconds. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I put eyes for a slow speed. Is that a joke? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even stand up in 3.7 seconds. Would you like me to time you? Is that another joke? <laughs> you can reduce my humour output if you like. <laughs> Could I improve it? No. <laughs> I don't see this lasting very long. But we must put on a bit of a show. Nine Nights, a traditional West Indian funeral parlour in Brixton, can no longer function. Archie Maddox, A Place for We, looks at the changing nature of cities and the identity of their inhabitants. Uh, hello, my name is Archie Maddox and I wrote the play A Place for We. The play is about a funeral parlour that practices nine nights, but they can no longer uh, pursue that, that business framing. So it's about whether they should change and adapt to their new surroundings or whether they should move on to where there are West Indians still doing that or whether they should do something completely new. I first had the idea for A Place for We when I was working in a funeral parlour. It's such an interesting place to kind of explore. Like gentrification, it's a complicated issue that I don't have answers to, but it is something I enjoy exploring. And so in this play, the issue of identity comes forward because one of the characters is mixed race and his father sees him as one thing, he sees himself as something else. Because in the last year or so, we've gone through so many changes so quickly that this play kind of highlights how quickly things can change on a international and a domestic scale. Dad, I had that. What did you have? Them, I had them. They were going to use us and you no, come in and... didn't. They didn't want to use we. They wanted something soulless. But I had them. You're a fool if you take We haven't had a fucking client for what? A month? Six weeks? The business is a little slow, but it always pick up around winter. That is not why the business is fucking slow. It's a warm. People hang on a little. But then when it gets cold, well, which people? Right? The Tell same which people that Nine Nights was built for. But they're all gone. They're all fucking. Watch them out. They're all gone, Dad. No, they're not. There's still Miss Angie, and there's Mr. Fleming, and there's, there's Rox, and, and, and James. Rox lives in Newcastle now. And Jamesy moved back to Trinidad, don't you get it? It will be fine. But all them people, the ones that brought the tradition over, they're all... And there's the next generation of people, people like me. So what? We always respect our tradition. So what? We have to wait for you lot to die to be able to afford a fucking Why loaf of bread. Why, I tell you, what your fucking mouth. Well, you know it's true. <laughs> so what? What do you think we should do then? We should be doing what you wouldn't let me do just now. No. Well, why not? Because that is what, not what my mind is for. And why can't we do both? No. Well, then we should leave them. Either sell up or... I tell you no! When my father first came here, he had nothing. Nothing except for the community of people like him. 
there was unity. That is what night night stands for. These ain't the same people. You don't know what you're Those speaking. people with the tradition you respect so much are either dead or gone. Can you see any West Indians, eh? Where are they? Are they hiding in all the rum shacks on Electric Avenue? Are they in the dances? There ain't no rum shacks and there ain't no dances. There ain't none of you here anymore. How do you mean? You. Mm -hmm. What? You just say. There ain't people like you here anymore. West Indians. Um, what are you? I ain't West Indian. <laughs> You're a Trini! I'm of Trinidadian heritage, but I'm not a Trini. You're confused! I'm not confused. <laughs> when I go over there, what do they call me, eh? English muffin. So you think you're English? I'm a Londoner. <laughs> you're confused! You're confused. You weren't even born there. And you think yourself a Trini? I'm a Trini to the bone! <laughs> to the bone! Why? I got the bone flowing through my veins, my heart, from me, me head back to me foot back on. <laughs> Trini! Your mother would be ashamed of you. She was English. She met her dad too. <laughs> but she knew that you were Trini. She only said all of that to keep you in Elmore, happy. Look, I know who you are. I know where you belong. And where's that? This is we home! We don't belong here anymore. The climate's fucking changing. There ain't no West Indian restaurants opening but the champagne bars and coffee cocktail. Can't you see it? Ain't none of us here anymore. They don't want us here anymore. They don't want any of this traditional fuckery anymore. This is we live! This is everything we have here. Without this, we die. And with it, I can't live. What kind of life is this? Fuck, Pops, I've got a baby about This is all I know. It doesn't have to be. Without this place, what is my life? And with it, what's mine? An American, a Russian, a Frenchman, and a Briton walk into a restaurant. When After All It Was You and Me, or the genocide play by Kevin Doyle, is an unflinching distillation of international relations. My name is Kevin Doyle. Uh, I'm the author of the play When After All It Was You and Me, or the genocide play. This play looks at the repeated foreign policy mistakes of Western governments in their responses to instances of genocide in the modern era. There's something to be said about us coming together in a space um, to watch something transpire in real time, to watch it unfold together, live. For me in my life, I've, I'm always been, uh, I always return to this as a theme about uh, Picasso and the painting Guernica. But for him, the photographs weren't enough. He, he had to do something else. Um, he, could not, he could not go on being himself or being Pablo Picasso without actually addressing this thing. And, and we have Guernica the painting as a, abstract representation of the event that comes at the events a different way than the photograph does. Because um, a lot of this text, for example, is based upon um, public uh, comments that uh, uh, government officials made or that were in the news. But I felt the need to kind of uh, offer some other structure. And that's what I tried to do in this play. Sven. What the hell is going on? Beat up. They don't speak English. Well, what language do they speak? I don't know. I've tried every language I know. Did you try Spanish? Si, nada. Did you try Italian? Si, niente. Sven, did it occur to you to try Swedish? Beat up. Did it look Swedish to you? <laughs> You're right. Definitely not Swedish. Thank you. Did you try Dutch? Beat up. They're definitely not Dutch. Well, what are we going to do with them? Peter, we have the training to overcome any linguistic obstacle. Yes, we are sworn to serve everyone who comes through our doors. Exactly, it's our duty. A family is in our restaurant, it's our duty to provide them with impeccable service. Regardless of how they look. Precisely. Well done. You get the drinks, I'll attend to our guests. Deal. <laughs> Monsieur Bernard, Mrs Townsend. What is going on down there? Is everything all right? What a scene! Will it happen again? Monsieur Bernard, 
<laughs> Mrs. Townsend, I can assure you, the staff and I have the situation completely under control. Our family is here for dinner, but I'm afraid they don't speak English. Don't speak English? Are they tourists? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, Mrs. Townsend. I suspect they might be tourists. Oh, do they speak French? Can I help? Uh, no, monsieur, they don't speak French. Do they speak Spanish? I know a little Spanish. My housekeeper is Spanish. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Townsend, they don't speak Spanish. Oh, do they know Italian? Oh. No, monsieur, we've tried every Romance language. Ah, yes. yes. then they try the Swedish. Michelle, do they look Swedish to you? <laughs> no, not Swedish. Um, maybe Polish or perhaps uh, Hungarian. Oh, oh, unfortunately, <laughs> sir, no one on staff speaks Polish or Hungarian. Well, even if they are Polish or Hungarian, they're out for dinner as a family. <laughs> they have just as much right to eat oh. here as we do. Well, regardless of how they are dressed, uh, 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 Peter, be sure that things do not spiral out of control. <laughs> we respect the individual's right to have dinner as a family. And what we do at the table is no concern of ours. Correct, <laughs> Michelle. As two friends, <laughs> we are sitting here at our table enjoying our own view of the world. We expect our rights to be um, respected. Uh, I, I hope they are. I agree, Mrs. Townsend. Now, I must attend to Mr. Smith, who may be very out of sorts. Uh, Mr. Smith. Peter, Mr. I'm very out of sorts here, Peter. <laughs> I'm very out of sorts. <laughs> yes, Mr. Smith. What is the point of all this racket? Well, you see, sir, do you realise how many sacrifices have been made over the centuries in order that I can sit here with my two pints and my pie? Uh, yes, Mr. Smith. It's I a great deal holding. of sacrifice. And a disturbance of this nature can have serious ramifications, Peter. Serious ramifications. I believe it is nothing more than a simple case of tourists. <laughs> Tourists, eh? Where from? They look like they might be Hungarian. Well, the possibility of Hungarians was discussed. However, Monsieur Bernard and Mrs. Townsend are in agreement that the individual and collective rights of each table will be respected. <laughs> the French and Americans, eh? Good to know that the Allies are aligned, eh, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Bernard. That's what I like about you, Peter. What say we sit down, have a pint sometime, and for old time's sake, you know, chat about um, ooh, uh, compound interest? Ooh, I'd like that, Mr. Smith. <laughs> I'd love nothing more than to talk about compound interest. But if you'll excuse me, we have more guests arriving. <laughs> Finally, in first-time playwright Rebecca Callard's A Bit of Light, Ella has moved into her dad's spare room with a few futon and not much else. She meets Neil, a teenager who refuses to see Ella the way she sees herself. My name is Rebecca Callard and my play is called A Bit of Light. It's about a woman who has lost everything, um, who's about to turn 40, which I thought was um, an interesting age. I am 42 myself um, and I was 39 when I started writing it, so I was Ella's age. And she's lost everything, and she meets a boy in a park. And, um, I mean, there's no one, it's, she says in the play, there's no one I hate more than myself, and that is true. And then this this boy comes in and, and just gives her all the things that she's looking for. They're in the same in the same place, in that he has an unconventional home life, and so does she. She's a mother, but she's not living with her children. I wrote quite a lot of it in Scarborough. I didn't write any on the beach but um, I didn't write any in the harbour bar. I thought to myself, if you, could, if you could go back to those moments when you were in that playground with your kids and you were sitting there exhausted, if you could go back and just say to yourself, just stop right now and feel this because it's going and it's not always gonna be here. It, it had to be a play, it was always a play because it has to be, it has to be found every night and it has to be said more than once. how small your hands are. You should be wearing gloves. Hello. I'm Neil. Hello. My name's Neil. 
Well, it's not, but that's the name I use now. <laughs> You're going to shake my hand? It's okay. <gasps> oh, cheesy puff, sorry. Oh. On my hands, I should have wiped them. It's too late now. <laughs> Your hand felt tiny. I don't want to. I don't either. Do I look like trouble? I sh should go. You usually stay till around six. What? Yeah, five or six. What? You usually stay until after all the other mums have gone. I sat next to you before, but you didn't see me, and it didn't feel right to talk to you then. It does now. It does now. Mm. You live far. I don't think that's... I, I'm not a nut. I could walk you home. No, thank you, no. I know that would seem nutty to you, offering to walk you home. Look. I'm not going to punch you in the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw on the news that a, lady, that a man punched a lady in the back of the head and just ran off. I'm not on Instagram or Snapchat. I don't even have a phone. I just thought you looked sad and I want to help. You're a child. I'm almost 14 and I'm taller than you. <laughs> It's not safe here in the dark. I saw that a lady was grabbed in the park at half past two in the afternoon. She was five foot tall. You'd be an easy target. <laughs> there's, a room, there's a rumor at school that there's a one-armed paedophile hanging around, but I haven't seen it. And to be honest, there isn't much that gets past me. I don't think he'd be interested in you anyway, if he was real. I'm almost 40 and I can walk home. Honest? You don't look 40. Well, actually, maybe you do. <laughs> I sat next to you loads at the picnic table. You didn't seem to mind me being there. You never looked at me like I was dirty. You never looked at me. You looked at the, the top of your hands mostly and, and at the little girls. <coughs> you do, you, you look at all the little girls and, and you look so sad. Did something bad happen? I did it. Did something bad happen? You can't <coughs> say that. Why? No one's honest. Or caring. People punch people in the head or squeeze on the bus like it's a fight to the death. And no one, no one asks if you're okay or is interested in the answer. I'm interested. No one is interested. I am. In things that bore everyone else. Like science and geology. <laughs> My dad's a scientist. He's going to cure cancer. I like psychology too. All you see of people nowadays is the tops of the red bending to the phones. They just don't talk anymore. You seem nice. I'm not nice. I was once, I think. I don't want to talk. You are nice. Promise. I know nice when I see it. I'm looking at stuff while, while the world's getting busy with lies. I'm actually looking at stuff like trees and clouds. My dad's scared of clouds. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I'm scared of everything. I'm not. We'll all be dead soon anyway. <laughs> Pretty soon. You're too young to talk about death. You're too young to look so sad. Who are you? I'm the boy that smells of piss. Yeah. <laughs> what? There's always a, a kid at school that smells of piss and I'm it. Him. You don't. I do. I can't smell it. You need to wear a coat. Do your shoes. Get yourself home. You should be. Wear gloves. My hands are not cold. I don't need a coat. My house is colder than here. I look at my hands because I wonder how they've got so withered. I'll see ya. <coughs> As we approach the announcement of the winner, I'd like to introduce Kate Folks, um, Head of Culture at Brontwood, who's going to make a special announcement. Good evening, everybody. Um, supporting new talent and stimulating creativity is at the heart of Brontwood's cultural focus, but actually it's the heart of Brontwood business focus, actually, as well. Um, and we are so excited to be part of the legacy and the ongoing commitment to supporting such fantastic talent on stages in Manchester and increasingly beyond. Um, and just 
talking of beyond, and a small anecdote actually, I was delighted to get a text from my son, my 15 year old son last week. I say a text actually, it was probably more likely to be a Snapchat from him. Um, and he was telling me that he was doing his GCSE, GCSE drama monologue piece on a um, Gareth Thar's 2011 Brentwood Prize winning play, which was absolutely incredible. It was absolutely incredible for me, um, and it was incredible to, uh, to then share that news with the, uh, with the family as well, as you can imagine. Um, and I think, I hope, like me, you'll have been so impressed with um, the shortlist uh, that we've had today. Um, and I think it's been alluded to already that the judges have had a very long and, uh, I believe, somewhat uh, heated um, debate around um, the, uh, the, the, the prize winners. Um, and I suppose I'd just like to slightly disrupt the process a little bit um, here and, uh, and just make special mention um, to two particular plays. Um, the last play that you saw then, A Bit of Light, um, and also the play This Is Not America. We felt, uh, the judges uh, felt, um, that the plays had a real sense of place and of urgency, of atmosphere and theatric <laughs> theatrical uh, ambition. Um, and they deserved a special commendation because of that. Um, and so with this in mind, uh, we'd like, as I say, to change the process slightly a little bit um, and, um, and add in um, a Bruntwood commendation in the form um, of a small grant of £4,000 to each of those two writers to enable them to continue... <laughs> As well as the money, hopefully something else that will be really important to them is some rehearsed readings here at the Royal Exchange Theatre to help support the development um, of the work. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to broker some relationships um, with some other spaces as well to be able to find the right home for those plays. As the, uh, the prize-winning family gets bigger and bigger, we're really thrilled um, to keep playwriting live and immediate and supporting these writers. Um, and I, I'm just delighted uh, to be able to welcome two more uh, into that family. So if I could just welcome um, Rebecca Collard and Collard, Col sorry, Collard, um, and Joshua Val Martin uh, just to join me on the stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much and congratulations to you both. Now it's time to finally announce the All Judges Award winners um, and these will go into development at the Royal Exchange. Please welcome 2005 Brontwood Prize Award winner, playwright Phil Porter, who's going to present the first Judges Award. Welcome, Phil. <laughs> Uh, thank you. It's uh, a real pleasure to be uh, presenting this uh, Judges Award. Uh, this award is for a play that uh, I liked so much that I literally thumped the table in the judges' meeting, which is uh, not like me at all. Um, uh, but it's a play that was admired by all of the judges. Um, it was thought to be a very uh, assured and very accomplished play um, that... Uh, drew comparisons to Tennessee Williams and uh, Sam Shepard, no less. Um, I read it uh, with a mixture of uh, real pleasure and um, kind of troubling uh, professional jealousy. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a really remarkable play. Um, uh, and so uh, luckily, I've, um, that was two months ago, so I'm now able to put that jealousy aside and uh, say that uh, this Judges Award was won by King Brown, by Laurie Nunn.
really heavy. <laughs> um, oh, thank you so much. That's I'm such a shock. Um, uh, I just want to thank a, a few people that really helped me um, get to this point. Uh, my agent, Jenny Miller, um, who really encouraged me to enter this play. Um, I actually entered it twice. I entered it two years ago as well, and she encouraged me to enter it then and then redraft it, and so I put it back in. Um, I want to thank my really good friend, Caitlin McLeod. Um, she's a really amazing theatre director who really encouraged me to sort of work on this idea and try writing the play. Um, and my boyfriend, Louis, who is here, I'm disoriented, he's somewhere over there. Um, and he read every draft of this play and he even read it out loud in an Australian accent, which was kind of incredible. Um, and also uh, my family, um, but in particular my mum, because this uh, play is really based on her story and uh, I wrote it for her. Thank you. <laughs> Phil, thank you. Laurie, congratulations. Now, please welcome the Royal Exchange Theatre's Associate Artistic Director, Matthew Zia, who directed the 2015 winner Wishlist to present the second of this year's Judges Awards. Um, hello, uh, and I will ex further extend the, uh, the welcome that everybody has given you to the Royal Exchange. Um, so, like everybody said, we did deliberate for what felt like days in that room. Uh, people left bruised, bloody, battered, uh, but with a, with a consensus, I guess, about, uh, that felt like a, a unanimous decision. Um, some of the things we said about this play, I, I've got some notes here from the judges' meeting that I thought would be quite useful. Um, the play is a bold invention, a great exploration of the search for meaning and our need to attach meaning to things. It's a play which explores the idea of going to the river and what it means to be alive now. It reads like a song. It asks really important, thought-provoking questions. Are we all constructs or what other people project onto us? Uh, the writer of this play described it earlier as dealing with a dangerous evangelism, and I think that's true. So we'd like to present the second judge's award to Plough by Sharon Clark. Hi, thank you. Um, there are just a very few people I want to thank. One of them is here tonight. Her name is Joyce Branner. And when I started out writing 15 years ago, I'm not an overnight sensation, by the way, is uh, <laughs> Joyce told me I could do this along with Gareth Machen at the Bristol Old Vic at the time. I then went on to be literary manager at that very same institution. I gave up that job last year to, to write. And so therefore, this is a huge validation of that decision for me. This prize is also for Alan Toyne, who has had my back many, many times, and when I've wanted to give up, has told me I'd be a fool to do so. I thank you. Matthew, thank you. Sharon, congratulations. Uh, finally, to present the last judges award, I'd like to introduce award-winning television producer and screenwriter, Russell T. Davies. Hello, thank you. It's an honor to be here in the greatest theater in the land. Yes, it is. Come on. It is. And it's an honour to be part of this. I tell you, we live in a terrible world. It's a terrible world. And when 10 new plays arrived, 10 people, 10 ideas, 10 new plays in the world, I felt like it was a very fine world, I must say. The winner of this, in the final awards, the final judges award before the number one winner, is not only being developed by the uh, Royal Exchange, but also by the Manhattan Theatre Club. I said to them, does that mean the winner of this goes to New York? They said, yes. So you can't argue now because it's on camera and it's gone online, so <laughs> that's a fact, okay? So, uh, this play, um, it was, uh, um, I, they said to me what to expect when, for, in a Bruntwood winning play. Oh, I thought at the beginning, I thought I expect plays about love and life and art and men and women and everything in between and better and beyond than that. I expected plays about Trump, about Brexit, about everything in the world. I did not expect a play about a robot in a convent. 
because the winner of this magnificent play, which is a truly beautiful examination of faith, of artificial intelligence, of where we're going, where we've been, is Tim Foley with Electric Rosary. <laughs> Thank you, thank, thank you. Um, I need to get it from him. That's, wow, wow, that's really cool. Um, I've got to thank uh, Pentapus Theatre, um, who uh, uh, a wonderful woman called Elizabeth Freestone um, scooped me up, and I, I spent a year on, on the farm I mentioned at the theatre. Um, Pentapus, it's, it's awesome. She's wonderful. Um, she's the one who I, you know, handed this script to her, and she was just like, "No, keep fucking going with it. It's great." Um, <laughs> And uh, it, it's now run by Sophie and Jenny, who's in the audience. There she is over there. She lent me her washing machine for an entire year. She's just, it was, it's the kind of thing, though, that I think so they just went above and beyond. And they just, you know, they, they get me well fed and stuff. <laughs> I, I, and I'm just really happy as well, especially Brunwood. Um, because uh, six years ago, it's the, it's the reason I put pen to paper. I heard about Ali McDowell's play, The Time Machine, in Middlesbrough. And I was like, I can do that. And... I have, and I hope someone is going to watch and in six years' time be like, Robert Nuns, I can do that. So you can. Yay. Thank you very much, everyone. Tim, congratulations. Russell, many thanks. Um, it has been, I think you've got the idea, a rather challenging task to steer the panel's deliberations this year. Um, it's a delight to welcome the chair of the judges, Kirsty Lang, who's going to announce the winner of the 2017 Bruntwood Prize for Playwriting. Welcome, Kirsty. Well, I, I don't want to dwell on how difficult it was. I just want to say there were no fisticuffs. It's very... Um, but we did get passionate... I think I'm very fortunate as, as an arts journalist and as a trustee of, of the British Council to have travelled uh, all around the world meeting people who are involved in arts, culture. And, and one of the things that always strikes me is the admiration um, the, for British theatre wherever you go in the world. Um, our rich theatrical tradition is something that we should be really proud of. Uh, but in order for theatre to remain relevant, uh, it has to be sustained by new writing. And I think the commitment shown by the Royal Exchange and Bruntwood in finding new voices is incredibly important. And I feel really, really proud to have been involved uh, in this uh, process and to have been invited to chair this year's prize. So, so thank you. Um, the Bruntwood Prize has been going for, for 12 years, and yet I, I think it's already reached the stature of, of, of the Turner Prize by showcasing the very best in up-and-coming talent in the world of uh, playwriting. And I think what also is so fantastic is that it inspires people to write plays, people who've never written plays before. I mean, the fact that out of nearly 2,000 entries, 30% were written by people who'd never written a play before, uh, uh, but were given the confidence to write uh, by knowing that they could enter the Bruntwood Prize anonymously. And I think the anonymous thing is really, really, really important, that they would get some expert opinion on their work and tips along the way provided by the fantastic website, which has um, uh, live stream playwriting workshops, lots of tips. It's just a great resource um, out there. And I, I like to think of the Bruntwood Prize as tapping um, the talent tree of British theatre and allowing new writing to flow out. Uh, I really enjoyed being part of the judging process. I mean, what a privilege it was to sit around a table discussing plays uh, with the people of the calibre of, of Russell T. Davis, Lucy Preble, Phil Porter. And of course, Phil was one of the very first winners um, uh, of the prize. As you've heard, he lasted over six hours, so quite tough. Um, also around the judging table was actor Alfred Enoch and directors Lindsay Turner and Matthew Zio, who were able to give us a real sense um, of how the writing on the page would translate 
into 3D on stage, because that's actually quite difficult. I think of a play as being like a bit of scaffolding, actually, and uh, there's a whole process and a whole bunch of other people who've got to put, you know, put on the, the bricks and the mortar and the plaster and, 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 and so on. Um, uh, so, you know, they gave us a sense of, of what it would feel like, and, and actually I remember at one point saying, I don't know, how's this play, how would this play be staged? And Lindsay saying, don't worry about that. That's the director's job. Um, and, and last uh, but, but not least uh, 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 amongst the judges was the chairman of Bruntwood, uh, Michael Oglesby, without whom none of this uh, would be possible. Um, and, uh, and he has, is also now a very experienced judge because he's uh, sat through every judging meeting uh, from the outset. But now, for the moment that uh, you've uh, been waiting for, the winning play, which comes with a cheque for £16,000, and even more important, in my view, um, a guaranteed uh, production, which means that all of you here will be able to see the play on the Royal Exchange uh, in the near future. And, and I just thought the, the play being produced, why it's so important, we were chatting beforehand, um, and uh, uh, again, Lindsay mentioned that there are lots of playwriting plays, or a few in the States, and they may come with checks attached, but none of them come with guaranteed production. And that's the really crucial thing about this prize, I think, is that you will be able to see uh, the winning play on stage. And it will, all the winning play will also be co-produced with the Royal Court um, in London, who are delighted to be continuing their partnership with the Royal Exchange. And this follows the success of previous Bruntwood winners, uh, Wishlist by Catherine Soper, who's here today, and uh, Yen by Anna Jordan. Now, this is what the judges had to say about the winning play. It points to a voice that we haven't heard before. Russell described it as fabulously mysterious with a lead character who leapt off the page. Lindsay Turner said she felt haunted by it, that it was taut, tense and atmospheric. Another judge described it as a drama that grabs you by the throat. The play begins with a stranger renting a spare room. The lodger's arrival soon exposes a wound within the couple's relationship. The stranger is a mysterious, enigmatic young woman with an element of danger about her. Joni Kay is a compelling character and it will be a great role for someone to play. The play is Heartworm and the writer is Tim X. Atak. <laughs> me. Um, do you remember that bit of the Oscars where they read out the wrong film? <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> and the other reason why this is kind of strange is because I've been working in this theatre for the last three weeks doing the sound design for Jubilee. Come and see Jubilee, it's really good. Thank you so much. I, thank you so much to... Uh, to Brentwood, to the Brentwood Prize, the organisers, the readers, the judges, the actors today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, I really would like to thank my partner, Tanuja, who has, for the last few years, been my, my, my script editor on pretty much everything I've written. I'd like to thank... Um, I'd like to thank some people who aren't with us today, um, who haven't been with us for a while. I'd like, uh, and as, as I said in the film, the feelings of some feelings of grief have been very important to the writing of Heartworm. So, I would like to thank my father John Atak, uh, my brother Mike Atak, and my other mother Daya Amarasuria, all of whom have in various ways contributed to me being right here today. Um, I miss them an awful lot. But then I'd like to thank my other father, CJ Amarasuria, and my mum, who's right over there. 
She remembers um, the first play I did when I was seven years old. It made absolutely no sense and had two endings. <laughs> What's changed? <laughs> um, and I'd like to say that, I mean, this is, uh, I think I'm right in saying this is the sixth, uh, sixth Bruntwood iteration. Is that, is that right? Um, I've entered five times. And I'd really like to say to anyone thinking of putting in a, a play for this prize, um, it's, it is worth every single time you enter into it. It is worth every bit of work you put into it. I was convinced that this play um, was, in some ways, the strangest thing I'd ever written. I was convinced that it was maybe kind of unfinished, that it had huge gaps in it, that it was a bit too strange to be considered. And look what happens. <laughs> Thanks so, so much. Thank you. Tim, congratulations, and congratulations to all of those shortlisted this year who's given us a real snapshot of the incredible playwriting talent that we have here in the UK. Thanks to the judges, Kirsty, the judges, the actors, of course, um, for bringing these short scenes to life and exciting us, I think. I'm certainly very excited about seeing some of these plays on stage in the future. Everyone who helped bring today's event today together and most of all, thank you to the writers for persevering, Tim, as you so eloquently put, and for putting your passion on paper and eventually on stage. Well done for entering the competition today. Thank you. That's the end. <laughs> it's time to grab a drink, grab some canapes, which will be outside, outside these doors. We'll ask the winners, please, to come to the stage with the judges for some photos, but celebrate, enjoy yourself. You're all amazing. Yeah.